housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you can please uh, mute your screens and hold questions to the end. We'll have a Q&A session. Um, at the end, um, where I'll read your comments in the chat window to Gail and uh, she'll, she'll respond in kind. And we'll have some announcements at the end. All right, so by way of introduction, Gail, if you wanna get started and um, share your screen and, with your slides. Um, Gail Dosset uh, received her PhD from the University of Ka in Normandy, and then um, went on to conduct her first postdoctoral fellowship at Thomas Jefferson University in the United States, and then a second postdoctoral fellowship at Mount Sinai University in New York. And while there, uh, transitioned to the role of PI and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. More recently, um, she is now a scientist at Boystown National Research Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska, where she is a, a PI and the director of the Brain Architecture, Imaging and Cognition Lab. So I'm very excited to be learning about Gail's newest work, um, here, the title, Individual Variability in Brain Network Organization. I've been following Gail's work for nearly a decade now um, for some of her pioneering work looking at the architecture of resting state connectivity in the human brain. And I'm delighted to have you here today. So Gail, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Well, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be virtually with you. Um, so, as uh, Dr. Sprang um, just said, um, I moved about six months ago to my new position in Omaha. So, my talk is going to be in two parts. The first one will be related to my work that I have done when I was in Mount Sinai in New York, uh, when I was working in uh, psychiatry. And the second part will be more related to what I'm doing now, which is all related to um, the brain mechanism related to aging. So as you probably, so I was mostly working on uh, data coming from patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And as you probably know, uh, those two disorders are um, leading causes of disability in the world. Um, just by itself, bipolar disorder affects about 46 million of people in the world. Um, it's a mood disorder that consists of both manic and depressive episodes separated by periods of normal mood while schizophrenia affects about 20 million of people and is characterized by distortion, you know, psychosis and in, um, including distortion of thinking, perception, emotion, and so on. So um, those two disorders actually share a lot, have a lot of similarity in the way that they share, they have overlapping clinical phenomenologies. They are both polygenic disorders. They are both associated with cognitive impairment and they're highly heritable. However, even though we know all those um, facts on those disorders, it's still very difficult um, to have effective treatment and good treatment outcome. And one of the reasons is that those disorders are very heterogeneous in the way that uh, people, there is a high heterogeneity in treatment outcome, cognitive impairment, symptom severity, genetic architecture. And so it has been uh, very difficult to find um, robust biomarker of those disorders. And so one um, recent new approach that has been developed is trying, instead of trying to find biomarker within those disorders, it has been to find biomarker across those disorders tr and try to identify more precise diagnostic um, categories or biotypes. Um, that could lead to maybe a better um, treatment and better outcome. However, what I think, um, you know, before we can really find novel and robust biomarker, it is so essential to understand the origin of this inter-individual variability. And I think that's kind of what is missing so far. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, probably the type of approach that we are using. Until now, the most popular approach used to understand this inter-individual variability has been a variable-based approach, right? That aims to quantify the degree of association between different features within individual. And it's clear that this approach has been instrumental in understanding the association between brain variation and age, cognition, sex in healthy subject and in a clinical um, population. Or just a simple example, it, it's this way that helped us understand the change of the brain throughout life. Um, you know, we know now how uh, the subcortical volume will uh, 
change across the lifespan. Another um, finding, uh, you know, help us understand differences between a group of patients and control. However, one of the major limitations of this approach is that um, it gives this false impression that all those um, findings can be applied at the individual level. What I mean uh, by that is that, for example, um, if we look at the graph of the relationship between age and the volume, the thalamus, for example, we can, uh, based on this negative um, association, we can assume that the um, thalamus has of a 20 year old um, will be bigger than um, the thalamus of a someone that is 70 year old. But actually, if you look really the data and really the individual points, as you can see here, it's the same graph with all the data coming from actually the Enigma uh, Lifespan Working Group, which has about 17,000 points. Um, we can see that actually a lot of individuals that are in their 20s have actually a thalamus of the same size of people that are in their 70s. And therefore, this relationship is not very meaningful anymore. Another um, you know, false impression is that, for example, we know that um, IQ is positively associated with cognitive treat outcome, you know, treatment outcome. However, we cannot assume that someone with a very high IQ will uh, respond to a treatment positively in everyone, everyone that has high IQ or will not suffer from um, dementia. And so I think we're ignoring, using such an approach, we're ignoring all the outlier and the meaning of those outlier. And so um, what I'm really working on and that I think is probably a complementary approach is more of a person-based approach, which aims to identify subgroup of individuals with unique characteristics. And in that way, there may be, um, you know, we may be able to categorize participants you know, patients or group of individual and maybe develop better um, treatment and understand better the, in the mechanism behind this variability. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And that's really what I have been interested in the last few years is trying to understand, you know, what are, what is the meaning of this inter-individual variability? Um, however, um, until now, you know, there, are, there were not so many measures that um, have been developed at the individual level to really understand that. Most of people, uh, you know, we will use standard deviation or coefficient of variation to uh, quantify this variability. But again, it will not tell us anything about this case or this case, you know. Um, it will just, again, tell us something at the group level, which may be misleading. And so in this context, um, I um, created a measure that is called Person-Based Similarity Index, or PBSI, which is a global metric that quantifies the variation, the inter-individual variation in, for example, brain profile um, at the level of the individual person. So um, for today, and just for the example, I will focus on brain structure and in particular cortical thickness and subcortical volume uh, because those measures have been well established. So I'm going to just give you an example of what this measure um, explains. So let's um, talk about, you know, cortical thickness extracted from free surfer, and we can have um, all the variable uh, for each person as a vector. And the idea is to compute pairwise correlation between each pair individual along those, um, using those vectors. So it, we will have one score per pair of individual that reflect how those profiles are similar between each other. And the last step is to basically average all those correlation for each individual to have one score per subject, where one high score, so if the PBSI is high, it will reflect how this individual's profile is very similar to the profile of everyone else, reflecting um, low variability, while a low score will reflect how this individual may have a unique profile, very different from everyone else. And in that way, we can try to understand why is this subject different from everyone else. So before I show you results um, on um, patient with psychiatric disorder, uh, what we wanted to do is uh, confirm that this measure is meaningful, at the bio, you know, biologically meaningful. Uh, because we can all create new measure, but if they don't mean anything, and if we cannot relate to anything um, 
at the brain level, it's, it's quite useless. So, so what we did is um, we um, used data coming from the Human Connectome Project and the Cambridge Center for Aging and Neuroscience Study, or the CAMCAN uh, project. And we extracted uh, subcortical volume, cortical thickness from free surfer, and computed so this PBSI score, person-based similarity index, for each individual and separately for subcortical volume and cortical thickness. And uh, what we found is we confirm uh, what we were hoping is that we found a very strong sex effect um, in each of our measure. Uh, while I'm only showing you the result for one cohort, we found the exact same uh, result for the second cohort. So our results are very reproducible and robust. So um, as you can see on the top, we found, for example, that uh, women showed higher PBSI score for the subcortical volume than the men. Um, suggesting that there is less variability in the woman uh, subcortical profile than in the men, which actually is very much in line with literature um, when we, um, of course, for a subcortical region at the, at the region level. Uh, we also found a strong significant nonlinear non relationship with age. Um, where, for example, if you focus on the right hand side bottom, uh, we found that the PBSI uh, in the cortical thickness show a very strong negative relationship with aging for individuals above the age of 60 years old, uh, suggesting that older adults show a very high variability in their cortical thickness compared to younger adults, which is also very much in line uh, with what we know about aging. So it was already a very good confirmation that our measure, uh, you know, follow what we were expecting. Furthermore, uh, we tested the degree of heritability of this measure using the HCP because they include data coming from monozygotic twins, siblings, and unrelated pair. And um, both PBSI score had an heritability of about 28%, which is uh, pretty good and very much in the range of what has been described for um, single regions. And on, the, on this graph, you can see actually we compared the PBSI score for monozygotic twins that showed um, stronger scores, so meaning that their profile are much more similar than regular siblings than unrelated pairs. So I thought that was actually pretty cool, and I think it would be an interesting measure to use in a patient with genetic disorder or when people study, you know, offspring of patient or something like that. I haven't tested it yet, but. Um, that would be a good thing to test. <laughs> anyway, so uh, with those results, we were very confident that this measure uh, may be interested to investigate in patients with psychiatric uh, disorder. So that's what we did. Um, and so we uh, collected data coming from patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and healthy control at Mount Sinai. Uh, we also were able to get two independent samples, uh, one sample for uh, bipolar disorder and one sample for a patient with schizophrenia in order to test the reproducibility of our, our result. And um, so here we have, the, we have the result for the comparison between a patient uh, with schizophrenia and healthy control. So on the left, the blue plots are uh, the result for our uh, Mount Sinai sample, and on, in the purple are um, the replicable uh, replicability the rest the result with our replication sample. And all our results were um, very, as you can see, very replicable in both independent samples. And what we found is that there was no actually no significant differences uh, between patient and control when we looked at the profile of the variability in subcortical volume. So patient did not differ from the controls. But we found actually very, a very strong and robust significant difference for the cortical thickness profile, where patients with schizophrenia showed lower score than the controls, suggesting that they show much um, higher variability in their cortical thickness measure um, than the control. And this result was, again, uh, very um, reproducible in both samples. We uh, further tested this difference to, 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 en to ensure that it was not related to maybe a specific region that kind of mess up everything, right? So we computed the regional contribution to the PBSI score in each group. Uh, and we basically didn't find any, any um, 
that are finding were driven by a specific region. As you can see, so that's the map of the regional contribution for the healthy control. And on the right, you have the same map for patients with schizophrenia. And basically, the two maps are uh, pretty much similar. So we know it was not driven by you know, just one specific region. Same thing, we also made sure that uh, maybe it was not related to differences in uh, variability, you know, in coefficient of variation at the region level. And again, um, we know it was not related to, um, to that, as you can see that basically the profile of the association between coefficient of variation and regional contribution was the same in healthy subjects and in patients with schizophrenia. So we were, uh, you know, pretty, uh, we thought our results were, you know, very consistent with the literature. And what was even more interesting is that there is a recent study that is still a preprint in bioarchive, but they basically uh, used our measure, and it's a totally independent uh, study, so they didn't even contact us. I just found myself this study online uh, when we were writing the paper. And so they actually computed the PBSI not on cortical thickness, but on the so-called width. Uh, in patients with schizophrenia and in healthy control, and they found very similar results to ours with uh, showing that patients had lower scores, therefore uh, more variability in their uh, sulcus so, so, um, width than the healthy control. But um, what they further did, and that I think was very interesting and confirming, you know, the, how we can use this measure is that they analyzed separately the participants that had very deviant score, we could consider them as outlier. You can see them on the here. And what they found is that those uh, deviant patients, um, of course, didn't differ in age, sex, quality control of the scan, and so on. But what they did, they were different in their IQ. All those deviant patients had significantly lower IQ than the patients that had more normal profile. And this finding was not present in the control group. So I thought it was, uh, it's, I think, really a proof that um, this, you know, a person-based approach may be very meaningful to identify subgroup of patients. Of course, you need really large sample size to kind of make it meaningful, but I think it's really going in the good direction to, you know, to show, to prove that um, such measure of inter-individual variability may really help us understand, you know, mechanism behind the pathology. We further investigated, you know, as I said, we also investigated the same uh, measure in bipolar disorder and against what we were expecting, we didn't find any significant differences. So as you can see, we tested it on, um, we computed our PBSI score for subcortical volume, cortical thickness, um, and as well as some resting state measure of within and between network connectivity. And we, again, we had two independent samples. And as you can see, there is no star. It was nothing was significant, not even at an uncorrected level, um, which is kind of unexpected, I have to say. But what it suggests is that um, the variability may be in brain structure and function that is found and described in bipolar disorder may just be nested in normal variability normal variation in normal range. Um, so, you know, all variability is not always abnormal, even in patients. So that's kind of what it suggests. And um, it can also help us maybe understand the differences between patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia as we were able to um, distinguish the two groups in the cortical thickness uh, profile where patients show significantly higher scores, suggesting that uh, those patients show less variability than the patient with schizophrenia. And so, you know, overall, um, this is, um, I, I mean, I guess I have a bias, but I really think that, you know, person-based approaches, um, you know, may be very meaningful, of course, uh, in complement of like a regular variable based approach. But I think it's a, a novel approach to really investigate uh, individual variability, uh, but just, you know, in pathology and in healthy subject as well. And we can really maybe identify a group of uh, patients and understand like those very unique characteristics. Um, but, um, and what I'm going now to show you is that I believe also that we can use this approach to study other um, other sources of variability, not just related to a, a, a pathology, but also, uh, in my case, um, the sources of variability in aging. 
And so I'm going to switch now to the second part of my talk, um, which is all about brain and cognitive aging. And so um, you, of course, you already know, I already mentioned it a little bit. We know that the brain function and structure will change um, throughout the life, right? From birth to death, we know that subcortical volume will change, cortical thickness also, functional connectivity, as well as, as I already mentioned, even the degree of viability in the cortex will change with age and will commonly increase in older age. Not only at the brain level, but also, of course, at the cognitive level, we know that there is high variability in older adults. Between uh, older adults that will show very preserved cognition compared to those who will show severe cognitive decline. And on the left side, you see the result of one study that I really liked from a few years ago uh, that was done on uh, the Campion sample that um, investigate um, so this cognitive variability in um, the participants that were, I think, above the age of 65. And what they suggested is that um, older adults that had, uh, that can report, that reported a very rich life during their middle adulthood didn't show um, this a correlation between cognitive ability and the brain size, while those um, who reported um, less activity um, during their middle adulthood show this uh, strong relationship suggesting that, you know, smaller brains associated with uh, more decline. And um, in the idea, they're suggesting that maybe there are some mechanisms that will protect um, the brain to um, shrink, you know, in relationship with cognition uh, in those adults that maybe have a better, a more active life when they are younger. And so that's kind of what I really want to investigate. It's the difference between those older adults that uh, will show preserved cognition versus those who show uh, decline. And so for that, I wanted to use my uh, new measure that I described earlier, the PBSI score. And instead of applying it on cortical thickness, I use the cognitive profile. So here it's done again on the CAMCAN sample that provided a large range of cognitive tasks. Um, I think I computed this measure on 39 variables. And as um, you may see, uh, we found um, you know, results that are you know, in line with literature where we found that the young people, so those are in blue under the age of 40 years old, show very high value suggesting less variability related to, you know, the selling effect that has been described and show no relationship with age. You can see the blue line, it's like totally flat. However, uh, while getting older, we can see that there is a progressive dec decline, um, decrease of this PBSI score suggesting in progressive um, increase of variability in the cognitive profile of all those individuals. And especially we can see that after a 60 year old, we have like really a large variability in those profile. And what I want to do, and I haven't done it yet, I'm in the middle of investigating the origin of um, this variability and do kind of like what the study of Jensen I described earlier did is investigating how those older adults may show very unique profile compared to those older adults that show actually very similar profile to young people. Uh, is it related to you know cognitive decline or maybe change in the brain? And that was uh, my idea. I wanted to link it, link this variability, cognitive variability with the brain functional organization. And for that, I thought I would look into the major brain um, resting state network. You all know probably about them, the diffomat network, which is shown in blue, the salience network in yellow, executive network in red and visual and sensory motor network. However, when I was looking for a, you know, a brain atlas that I could apply to my data of older adults, I realized that all of them, at least all the ones that I knew and that are available, are based on um, young adults, as you probably realize. Um, they're all basically done on subjects that are under the age of 30, 40 years old. Um, and knowing that uh, age has such a strong impact on functional connectivity, I thought that 
um, that would just bring more variability in my own data, especially knowing that even between those atlas of young adults, there is already a very large spatial variability. So I just didn't want to use any of them. And so I started to look into um, collecting um, resting state data from cohort of older adults, and I found three of them. So I um, extracted the resting state data of all the older adults of the CAMCAN. So I, uh, my age range is um, 55 years old and older. And so we had about 246 um, healthy adults in the CAMCAN. And I found also two other cohorts, the SALT cohort, which stands for the Southwest University Adult Lifespan data sets that is available through the 1000 functional connectome project that included 185 healthy adults and the ADNI that um, I think everybody knows, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative um, that included 132 healthy adults. And so all those subjects, so for a total of 563, um, had both resting state data and a structural scan. And we um, um, identified um, the major resting state network in each of those individuals in each cohort uh, using a combination of clustering and single subject ICA. And I also identified the major five network in each of those cohorts. And so the first point was just make sure that um, those networks uh, are kind of reliable and robust uh, across them. And so um, on the right, you can see the, the, the average spatial overlap across the three cohorts. And as expected, we found that um, the network overlapping, uh, you know, um, overlapping with the primary cortices, sensory motor network, and visual were those that were the most robust, especially while the salience network uh, was the one with um, the most special differences across them, which is quite expected. We know that even in young adults, the salience network is not the most well defined. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised on that. Anyway, um, so the idea then is, of course, to confirm or not that those networks are different from uh, the same network extracted from younger adults, because if the network are the same, then what is the point to have normative resting state network for late adulthood? So using the exact same approach and the same data, I use the data coming from the young adult of the CAMCAN sample. So everybody under the age of 35 years old, 18 to 35. And I extracted, again, as I said, um, identified the same network. And my idea was to compare um, the network of the young versus the old, or old versus old, based on the CAMCAM sample. That way we correct for site, um, MRI acquisition, and so on. And we found what we were expecting is that the network coming from younger adults shows significantly less overlap with um, network that have been identified in older adults than if we take another independent older adult cohort. So that's exactly what um, I was expecting and that really proved the point that we need um, age appropriate brain template for brain organ for to investigate the brain functional organization in late adulthood. And so um, that's uh, my newest atlas that I called um, Atlas 55 Plus. So it's a consensual atlas of the five major resting state network um, across all the three cohorts. Um, and uh, on the right side, you have the confidence map, which reflects how uh, you know, especially robust this network is, uh, this atlas is across the three cohorts. So all the region in red, which is most of the brain, show 100% of confidence, suggesting that in each of those three cohorts, um, this, each voxel was defined, was labeled in the same way across the three. So it's high, it's actually really good um, reliability. We, we found very good results. Almost. And um, so, of course, um, I wanted to go a little bit further and see uh, the special differences. Where were they located between Atlas 55 plus and the same network identified in younger adults? And so we, again, use the um, younger, the network identified in the younger sample of the CAMCAM. -CAM. So the young 
network is um, younger adult network is in red and the atlas 55 plus uh, based on older adult is in blue and i mean it's it is kind of um, striking that there are uh, clear differences uh, with um, Again, the network that, uh, of, that covers the primary cortices showing the least special differences, especially the visual network was the one the most similar. I think it's overlay with like um, overlap at more than 80%. So it's, it's really, really stable and it suggests it's really not so much uh, influenced by age. And the least um, similar was the salience network again, which is again, not totally uh, unexpected. But what I want to point today is about the medial temporal lobe, um, where we found that the, medial, the whole medial temporal lobe um, that you see in red and that is part of the DMN in the younger adult switch to the executive network uh, in older adults. And I thought it was uh, pretty interesting. And I think it's pretty much in line with uh, the model developed by Dr. Sprang and the Disha, where we know that the, the, coupling, the coupling of the DMN and the executive network will change with aging and may be associated with cognition. So I haven't tested it yet, but that's kind of in my goal. It's uh, my next step. Um, and what is important to also say is that this result was actually robust across the three cohorts. So we also provide a subdivision of, for each of the major resting state network. And we only report subdivision that we found in each of the three cohorts. And as you can see uh, where my mouse is, is that in the executive network, we do have this medial temporal subdivision present, suggesting that we did find it in each of those cohorts. So it's really a stable result. It's not just linked to, you know, one cohort driven by one cohort. Um, so, you know, I'm going to here, but um, what is, I think, just important to remember is that the variability sources in older adult may be different from the one in younger adult. And it's, in that case, it's really important to, um, to adapt you know, our atlases or our mechanism method, everything to our age um, group uh, in order to reduce the origin of variability that we're trying to already study and, and reduce. And um, I think Atlas 55 plus may be you know, one way to go, at least when we're investigating the brain functional organization in late adulthood. Um, to my knowledge, it's actually the only uh, Atlas uh, available um, based on resting state data of more than 500 healthy participants above the age of 55 years old. And um, it's also uh, accommodate, you know, differences in neuroimaging acquisition parameter because all those cohorts had really different parameters and yes, I mean, it was not easy to handle. And also, uh, it's actually independent in sample composition. Uh, as I didn't say, it, but, you know, CAMCAN sample has been collected in UK, ADNI is collected in North America, and the salt was collected in China. So um, that's also a good variability in that way. And um, so everything is available. Um, this paper is still, so it's on BioArchive, but it's also under review and it's um, on my um, research gate if people are interested. Um, but I'm happy to also uh, talk about it later. And of course, I want to uh, finish there and uh, thank um, my previous mentor and co-worker uh, that helped me with this project, especially Sophia Frangu and Mark Giulio, and um, now my new co-worker and men uh, mentor and, uh, you know, uh, collaborator, um, Tony Wilson, Vince Calhoun, Paul Thompson, um, and Noah Hamlin, which is my research assistant. Thank you very much. All right, Gail, thank you so much for your talk. That was wonderful. Um, looks like uh, Andrew Lynn has already hopped in with a question um, saying, great talk. Do you have an idea of what sample size is required to have a robust PSBI measure? Yes, so actually um, I did like a previous paper on investigating this, uh, oh, PBS, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the Atlas. Yes, so actually we did study the uh, si sample size and it's actually pretty, pretty stable, even with a s small sample size. So I know we, um, we did like um, 
permutation sample, you know, and resample, we tested at 10% or something like that, and it was still pretty good. So our sample was done, I think, so bipolar, we had only 40 people, I think, and it was pretty stable. So I think, you know, I mean, I would not go with 10, of course, but um, but you, you can try it, you know, it's, um, I think probably 30 or 40, it's good enough. Right. That's but in the paper, um, we have like on supplementary information, we have described all that and we have shown all the graph. Uh, but what I would say is more, in, it's not about the sample size that matters so much. It's about the number of variables you include in the measure. Uh, we notice that under 10 variables, it's not stable because, you know, it's, it's a correlation. So you want uh, enough variable to make a good correlation. So you, you need at least 10, uh, a good, yeah, at least 10 variables to make it good. All right. So, all right, another question. The cognitive activity seemed to affect brain size. What about fetal brain size in relation to cognitive ability being different from that measured for the young or adult samples used in this study? Well, I've never worked with fetal uh, data, so I'm not sure I will be really able to answer this question, but uh, do we, I mean, do we even have, I mean, now there is the HCP developmental uh, sample, I think, but I, I haven't worked on it yet. And I, I mean, I'm, I have never really worked with like really young data sets. So I, I don't think I can really, maybe Nathan, you may know more about children, but I honestly, I, I'm not very good with, um, you know, I can tell you about young adult and, but, but not so much under that. Right. Well, Gal, I really appreciate your work kind of building a functional series of brain atlases for people who are late middle age, for older adults. Um, I think we recognize for a while, you know, we need these sort of anatomical templates for normalization that it's when we only align with the MNI, we're sort of punishing these um, older adult samples because their brains are different. So I think this is a great approach you're taking. Um, I, I do have a question um, about you know, the selection of the networks. And this is something that, of course, is subject to a lot of debate. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you've you arrived upon a, like a five network solution. We know like Thomas Yeo's approach looks at seven. seven. Um, <laughs> but I think the most sort of notable difference is, um, you know, the absence of the dorsal attention network in your five network solution. So I was wondering, so what your thoughts are with that? And like, yeah, so it's it was a choice. It's, it, so the five, network choice was a choice from the start. We didn't let the clustering approach tell us how many network we just used because they were, so, you know, we used an ICA approach to get all the network and it can become so overwhelming with like deciding at what level uh, we, you know, we should cluster the network that we, I just um, chose a five network because we published another paper uh, last year about a consensual atlas of five network. And I use that as template to kind of match all the network. And I just chose five because I don't like this seven network solution. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's one of the limitation. It's, it's a pure choice. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of a six network solution. Personally. Yeah, six, My same bias. thing. I don't like the affective network, but uh, I know I could have got with the dorsal attention. Also, so far, it has been combined with a working memory, like the executive network. That's what I was wondering because I was yeah. trying to figure out where MT. Mm -hmm. and it has I... been combined with uh, the executive network. Okay. All right. Great. Um, I guess eventually, maybe I just like looking at this work. Is it your plan to build like a, the person-based similarity index from resting state connectivity? Yeah, I would like to do that. I, I haven't, I, so I tried with the bipolar sample and so it didn't give a lot, but I'm going to plan to do it on, yeah, on the older people and the young people and see a little bit. But again, you, we just, I just need to choose which atlas and which, <laughs> which measure and <laughs> that become a little bit more, you know, challenging to justify. So, uh, but yeah, or maybe I think we're using graph theory, you know, measure of graph theory and looking at the profile of all the graph theory measure is probably maybe a better approach than within and between network measure. But nice. so you see what I mean with using the node, um, something like clustering coefficient, I think might be a good way. Across the nodes and then mm -hmm. correlating the nodes across subjects. Yeah. That would be really interesting. 
I think. <laughs> so do we have any other questions from our, our group of our audience members? All right, so I think we might begin to wrap it up. Um, I just have a, a couple announcements to make um, before you go. So next week uh, for the Findell Virtual Brain and Mind Seminar Series, we have, um, let's see, we have Alessandro Gozzi who would be presenting Unraveling Brain connect Connectopathy with Cross-Species FMRI. And then coming up later in November, on November 11th to the 12th, we have the Neuro Gardner Open Science and Action Symposium. So the Neuro, um, the world's first open science health research institute and the Gardner Foundation, best known for Canada's premier prizes in biomedicine. They've joined forces this year to host the second edition of the Neuro Open Science and Action Symposium. This virtual two-day symposium will bring together global leaders in open science, including researchers, patient advocates, policymakers, funders, industry, philanthropic organizations, and science communications for critical exchange via lectures, panel discussions, workshops, and networking events. So please check out the Neuro's webpage for Neuro events, where more information on the registration for this event can be found. All right, Gil, again, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's wonderful to yeah. see it and um, these directions you're taking it now that you're at, at Boys Town National Research Hospital. Um, I really look forward to talking to you more in the future um, as these yeah. things unfold. Absolutely, hope we can stay in touch. <laughs> All right. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, to see you next week. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>